Boy, I love that song. It is well with my soul. Hallelujah. Amen. Is it well with your soul tonight? Amen. I pray. And we're going to be doing some of that. Uh, the Bible tells us that uh, the Lord would like for his house to be a house of prayer. Amen. Amen. I know that we have many that are out tonight, and we're going to take the time, pray with them this evening, pray for them, I should say. Turn your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of James. James chapter 5, and uh, we're going to be concluding this book tonight and preparing, the Lord wants me to prepare the rest of the messages for, uh, for our celebration of Christmas, amen? In this uh, fifth, thank you, <laughs> so kind, thank you, thank you. In this fifth chapter, um, it starts off talking about the woes of rich men. It begins talking about people who have put all of their security and their hope in what they can collect in their accounts or on a piece of property. And, uh, and obviously, in this, we don't want to, uh, to make things the object of our desire. I could spend the message on that, but I choose not to. And read it for yourself. And then talks about uh, the coming of the Lord and the patience in waiting for his return. And we could delve into that at another time as well. I pray that you've had an opportunity to read all five chapters of James, one of the most practical books of, of Christian conduct that we have available to us. Um, there are inspirations for example, and, uh, and thank you that there have been those that have gone before us, including our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, uh, we identify with him in our sufferings. When we get to the 13th verse of, of James chapter 5, it begins to talk about praying. And I want to spend the time looking at the last verses of this book uh, to, to chapter 20, from 13 to 20. And uh, I saw somebody had posted a passage of scripture on band today, which was uh, Psalm 23, one of the first Psalms that I committed to memory. And it was in a time that was actually good. And I wanted to have God's word in me. And so I committed that to memory. And uh, I'm very thankful for that because I can't tell you how many times I've prayed that, whether things were good or they were difficult. Uh, I sat there and just prayed this psalm. And I'm hoping that we can do that tonight. Prayer is something that we see that Jesus teaches us when, uh, when the disciples asked him, Master, teach us to pray. And so we see even in the, uh, what we call the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, we see that he takes the time to talk with them and express to them what prayer is. In this, James is taking it and making it uh, practical. He doesn't go into a lot of details in any of this. And so I hope tonight the Lord will allow me to do that with you. In verse 13, I'm going to read this through. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions, as we are, and he prayed earnestly that, the, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any uh, of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which uh, uh, converteth the sinner... From the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your strong word. Thank you for your guidance in this life. Thank you, Lord, that we have this practical book that uh, we can glean from and understand better how we're to conduct ourselves in this life. Lord, we give you all glory. We honor you for all that you've done in our lives and are doing in our lives. And we have the expectation, if there is any expectation, that you will continue to be faithful in our lives. We thank you for this, and we give you all glory. And the church said, amen, amen. So when it comes to prayer, this has been an area that has been um, pretty amazing, very dynamic. Uh, for some, it is difficult. And I remember the first time that I was asked to pray in a service, I had just given, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I hadn't yet given my life to Christ. And I was asked to pray. And it was, looking back, probably the clunkiest thing that I had ever participated in. I was so self-conscious. I was so self-aware of the things that were coming out of my mouth that it was embarrassing as I was talking. And after I gave my life to Christ, things did change. Um, it was very uh, humble circumstances that brought me to this humble place before the Lord. And I just began to share my heart to the Lord. I was enamored with Scripture. I could not get enough of Scripture. So I was reading constantly the Word of God and then was finding myself praying in line with what His Word said. I thought that was very neat. So in this, we're not going to go too much, I think, into um, uh, how we might pray, but when we should pray for certain. And he says here, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. So if there is suffering, if there is affliction, this is a time that we should most certainly pray. I watched a, uh, a documentary on a man's uh, calling on his life to minister in Uganda, and it was a completely different ministry than anything that you and I uh, would participate in because it is a war-torn place. And when he went there, he found himself, um, people thought that maybe he was a mercenary as opposed to a missionary because he took arms with these people and were killing terrorists to save children and bring them, built an orphanage there and just went through so many different things. And there was such great affliction. And I don't, the affliction that we see, brothers and sisters, usually isn't that intense compared to what some of our other brothers and sisters are experiencing in the world. But definitely the times of affliction in our life are times when we find ourselves in prayer. And if we find ourselves here uh, suffering tonight in any way, I want us to take the time at the end of this service or in the middle of this service or right now and pray. As you feel led during this service, be inclined to, to come forward and say, I'd like prayer over this issue. And let's pray. We have several that are sick tonight. We're going to get to that. And, and we want to pray for them as well. But in times of suffering, it seems, as it says in verse 13, <laughs> this of all times is a time we should be praying. In verse 13, it also says that when uh, we are merry, let him sing psalms. And have you ever been in a place where you were in prayer and it broke out into song? That you're actually talking with the Lord and, and things were going good and you're praising him and you began to, to sing a new song for him that usually incorporates a lot of the Psalms that you've read. Has anybody ever done that? Just me? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are some blessed times, brothers and sisters. And, uh, and we should... We should definitely um, be praying his word. Singing psalms is also praying. When I'm singing, even when I'm singing here, I am before him, I am singing. I, the words that are coming out of my mouth aren't just words. I'm really saying this in song. And so many of the songs that we sing actually come from the psalms themselves pieces and parts, psalms that, uh, that, we, that we pray. And so Psalm 23, I saw it today, and I'd like to take just a, 
a moment, if we could, to pray this together. And, uh, and then I want to encourage you to pray psalms yourself. I would take the liberty of, of reading it if we weren't so familiar with it. It's a very short psalm of six verses. But the Lord is present with us, and we have this beautiful privilege of prayer. You know this? That when we find ourselves suffering or when we find ourselves soaring, the Lord is available. He's listening. It's very welcoming. We are humble before his throne, but he tells us to come boldly before his throne. Amen? So we should find ourselves praying often. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. In this, let us go to the Lord in prayer, and I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us. I thank you, Lord, that you are doing so many dynamic things in our life, and you are a good shepherd. Lord, I pray that we could be faithful sheep, that we would follow. We can hear your voice. Lord, we don't want to be distracted by anyone else. And Lord, we want to know that you are actively present in our life, that you're never too far away as a good shepherd is. And when we are in your presence, we lack for nothing. We truly have no needs or desires. You are a provider. You are a protector. You are a teacher. You are a comforter in times of difficulties. And so we find ourselves with you. And your word says that we shall want not. Lord, this is truly seeing that we have no lack in your presence. There are times where we get so busy, Lord, that we have difficulties hearing you, spending time in your word, speaking to you even. And so your word tells us that you will make us to lie down in green pastures. There are times, Lord, where we find ourselves so distracted that you make us to lie down. What does this look like? For some, it may be a cold that has caused them to pause from this world, from this life. We know that your ways are not our ways, and we claim to know your perfect will, but we struggle and strive every day. So, Lord, when you make us to lie down green pastures. I pray that we will hear your words, that we will spend time in communion with you, not just reading your word, but speaking to you, and you restore our souls. This truly is something that we are thankful for, that in all the calamity and the chaos of this world, that you yourself lead us to still waters. There are times of difficulties where we find ourselves fearful and we don't like to admit that we're scared of certain things, the uncertainties of our, of our future. Business deals and work, family members, all kinds of things can, can cause us uh, this calamity. And though we walk through the shadow of the valley of death, we will fear no evil. These are merely shadows, Lord. Thank you for letting us realize this. Thank you for holding our hands through these times, shining a light on our path, that you are giving us guidance, especially in those difficult valley days. But Lord, no one is ever afraid of a shadow. Thank you for the confidence that we have when we walk with you, that we will, in fact, fear no evil. You truly are with us. Not only are you with us to guide us, but you are in us to lead us out. This, Lord, comes through correction. This comes through discipline. This comes through your discipline on us. But it also comes as a comfort that you will take care of our enemies. You go before us and you stand behind us. You're on our left and on our right. You go before us in such a way that you make the crooked path straight, that you take the hills that look like immountable obstacles in our life, and you fill in the valleys that have the same appearance, and you make our paths straight. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. It truly is a great comfort. As we know that we have many enemies, just as you did, and you tell us in your word 
that they will hate you because they hated me first. And then you go and you prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Help us, Lord, not to invite the enemy to sit at the table, but they can see that you have anointed our life, that you have blessed our lives, but yet here we are enjoying a feast with our king in the presence of our enemies. Our cups surely do run over and you anoint our heads with oil. Lord, thank you for this sanctification. Thank you, Lord, that you have set us apart even when our enemies are present. For surely you are the only one that is good and your goodness and your mercy, a perfect mercy, something that we strive to understand over and over again. The abundance of your mercy rests on us. The abundance of your goodness shall follow us all the days of this life. And then we surely have the hope and the assurance that we will dwell in your house, the house of the Lord. Thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Whether we're suffering or whether we're soaring, God's word is there and we can pray his word. Sometimes things are going on and we actually don't even know what to pray, do we? I'm telling you right now, there's a very safe place with God's word talking with him in this way. Amen. In verse 14, let me get back to, uh, to this. In verse uh, 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Going on to confessing our faults one to another. In this, I have gotten calls. And people have asked me to come to their homes and pray with them. We've done it here in church. But so many times people don't call on anyone, even the Lord, in times of sickness. You know, I know that we have many people that are out today, and I would like to take the time to pray for them today. I hope that this service is okay, that God's house is a house of prayer. And because this ends talking about prayer and times when we should pray, I can't think of any other time that we should pray than in church, especially when we're going over scripture that, that uh, implores us to do that. Amen? I have seen people healed and I have seen people not healed. Maybe it's the same prayer, the same faith, but yet at the same time, God's ways are not our way. I have seen some that have gone on to have very powerful ministries and they have had people pray over them and pray over them and anoint them with oil and yet they still have this deficiency or disability. Uh, one of the men that comes to mind is a man who has a ministry that's called uh, Faith Without Limbs and is a, a uh, can anybody rem remember his name? Yeah, I'm going to do that to you. <laughs> uh, Nick, Nick Virtue, uh, he's got a long, long name, long name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nikovich, amen. I think that that's it. We're going to say that it is, in Jesus' name. The Lord knows who we're talking about. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless you. This is somebody who has had many people praying over him that his limbs would grow, but he, God is using him in such a powerful way to minister to the youth like I have never seen before, that he has overcome this obstacle, this mountain that was before him, but the Lord still saw fit not to grow his withered limbs as we saw the Lord do himself. And at other times, we have seen people be completely restored. I was thankful that Michael called on the elders of the church after his stroke, and we went up to the hospital just a month ago, anointed him with oil praying over him, had an opportunity to minister to some of the nurses that he was ministering to as well, showing them in scripture some of the, the things that they're dealing with and, and just a beautiful thing. And glory be to God. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, but listen, 
More importantly, and the Lord shall raise him up. He had the trust and the faith to do exactly what the word of God said. And then there was faithful men that understood the word of God and did exactly what we were already instructed to do. And the Lord has re restored you and has lifted you up 100%, no sign of a stroke whatsoever. Hallelujah. God is good, amen? God is so good, and I'm so thankful for that. Hallelujah. We have others that, uh, that can't be here today, and, and, and rightly so. I was, very, it was, a very, uh, I was questioning whether I should have come to church three weeks ago when I wasn't feeling well, didn't have a fever or anything like that. I thought, oh, Lord, of all the places where the sick could go, shouldn't it be at church? I mean, I know that we want to be very compassionate for others, and we're not interested in giving somebody else the flu or anything like that. But at the same time, I wanted to be here if I didn't feel that it was contagious, and I wanted, I wanted the church to pray for me. Now, they'll sell the, they'll, we'll say that we'll pray, and some people do pray, in fact, for others. But I thought, can't get away from it here, amen? <laughs> if you need prayer in church, this is where you can come. This is where you can get prayer. Hallelujah. So when our times to prayer, when we're suffering, when we're soaring, when we're succumbing to sickness even, is a wonderful time to have people to pray over us and to pray for us. And then it goes on even into this in the confession aspect. So most of the time we focus on physical healing because it's something that we can see. But brothers and sisters, listen to me. How many of us suffer with an emotional sickness all week long? We don't share it with anybody. We're caught up in some part of the past, the apprehensions of the future, things that have just recently taken place and that have hurt our hearts, that have hurt our spirits, that have hurt us emotionally. But yet these are not the things that we actually bring forward. I'll tell you right now, if anybody can see a healing in emotional sickness, it's you. Amen? You can see the healing that takes place in your own life. And, uh, and this is part of the uh, confessing your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When should we be praying? Brothers and sisters, we should be praying even in times when we find ourselves in sin. Most people think that all believers never sin again, but I'm telling you right now, we do. We do in thought, we do in deed, we do in words. When should we pray? When we're suffering, when we're soaring, when we're succumbing to sickness, and when we're struggling with sin. When we're struggling with sin, this is a time where we certainly, have you ever been at a place where something was going on and even the only way to please God is to have faith, but you are struggling with something so, it was so difficult that you didn't want to read the Bible, that you didn't want to talk to God about it, that you didn't want to go to church, and you certainly didn't want to mention anything because you knew going to church, you were going to have to put on the veneer, that smile. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. No, you're not. We want to be genuine and sincere with the Lord, even with others. When we're struggling with sin, and then in verses uh, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I just want to point out that this, uh, we need to be praying with spiritual strength. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This means that the person should be living a righteous life before God, not out of compulsion, not because they feel like they have to, not that they're checking boxes, but because of who they serve that they live a life that is pleasing to God. And when they pray, it is not just a prayer, a light prayer. It's not just thrown off. It's not just thrown their way. It's not even a blanket prayer. I've heard some folks, they put together a prayer that covers all the bases and they just drop that on people everywhere they go and they sound spiritual. 
but there's no fervency. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I would say in this of uh, men and women, mankind, anthropos, however you want to look at this word, it is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. What is the greatest thing that we could be in prayer for when it comes to sin? Obviously for ourselves. But what about those who are in darkness? What about family members that are in darkness, they're living in sin, and we should be praying for them? How should we be praying for them? I oh, hope you save them, Lord. Or it is, the, is it the effectual fervent prayer to God, petitioning him? Even as we see in other passages of Scripture, you can have an unrighteous judge, but because of the constant petitioning before the Lord, whatever's being asked is granted. How much more should we be praying for those who are lost in sin? Anybody have anyone in mind right now that they'd like to lift up in prayer that does not have a relationship with the Lord and you have tried ministering to them, but you want continued prayer? And maybe, maybe even the fact that, that you can't muster up the fervency to pray for them anymore because it's just not going to happen. I mean, you almost kind of relegated, Lord, it's in your hands. I'm done with the effectual fervency of praying for their souls, for their souls. And should they perish without a relationship with Christ, they will die and they will be tormented in hell. Now, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but let's put it in this proper perspective. All the things of this life, all the wealth, all the prosperity, all the health, all of that is wonderful. But to have all that and to lose your soul, what does it gain? What is the profit? So how much more should we be praying for those that are suffering with sin? Any names? One name? Brother? Hmm. It was a what? Oh, okay. Please remind me his name. Dennis, that's correct. Of course it is. <laughs> He's been going by that for a long time. Dennis, Dennis. Can we pray in agreement for Dennis tonight? Amen. I pray so many, Father, we come before your throne and we are so thankful. We are so thankful. Lord, we lift up to you, Dennis. Lord, you, you see him. You know everything about him. Lord, there has been so much prayer coming his way. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify him for this purpose of salvation. Lord, that you would even draw a circle around him and that you would bless him, Lord. That you would continue to bless him. Bless him. It is the love the love that you have that draws people to you. And we ask that you would continue to bless him, Lord. Bless him with good health. Bless his eyes, Lord. Bless his hands. Bless his provision. Lord, let it know, let him know that, that this comes from you. We know that it comes from you. But Lord, we ask that you would bless him, sanctify and bless him. And Lord, in this blessing, Lord, we pray that you would convict him of his sin, that he would see it for what it is, that he would see it from your perspective, that it would become a huge weight in the midst of all of your blessings, Lord, that his mind would gravitate to how he's turned his back on you, how he's snubbed his nose to you, how he's raised his fist to you. And Lord, that you would in this place illuminate his mind. Show him yourself strong and mighty. Lord, that you would open his eyes, that the scales would fall off, that you would open his ears. But most importantly, Lord, that you would open his heart 
reveal yourself, King Jesus, to Dennis. And Lord, we pray that you would save him. Save him. Save him from himself. Save him from an eternity separated from you. And Lord, from this, let the bond of love between him, his family, especially his daughter Faye, Lord, that, that it would be beautiful, that it would be so apparent, the 180 change. He is a, a nice man. But Lord, the only one that makes us good is you. But Lord, we ask that you would make him a good and righteous man of God. In Jesus' name, your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Then we'll continue as that's on our hearts. Pray for Dennis. So praying with spiritual strength, and in verses 17 and 18, it talks about Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I see this as something far more powerful than what the scripture allows to put in these two verses. But when you go to 1 Kings uh, chapter 17 and 18, and you start to see the relationship that Elijah had with God, that it would say, and the word of God came to Elijah, and the word of God came to Elijah. And, and he would pray the things that he heard from God. And this is the kind of prayer life that we want to have. I want to pray in such a way that if you told me to pray for the rains to stop, which seems pretty crazy, I would do it because I hear your voice. This is something so much more. People can focus on the rain itself or the relationship that was cultivated in prayer. Some people want to see that instead of having the relationship that Elijah had. I want the relationship that Elijah had. He was the only one that was told by God to speak these words, and he spoke those words, and that took place. And then God came to him again, and the word of God came to Elijah again, and God told him to pray that it stopped raining. And so he was living in obedience to Christ. Because that's the only time that we actually see that. I see that more of being the relationship as opposed to being the weatherman. The relationship, he was God's man. And that's who we want to be, God's men, God's women. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. I always thought about this. Like, Elijah did that. Why, why don't we have the, uh, uh, the ability to just go and do that? Now, we can get lucky, and we can probably pray in coincidence, but I was thinking, even through scriptures, when we see these things, and we see Jesus calm the storm, peace be still, Jesus did it. And then you start looking through scripture and it's uh, rare to find anything else mentioned about that ability, but everything talks about relationship. Everything talks about how to build this relationship with God. That's what the whole word of God is really about. And I thought about even uh, Paul. He says, I was shipwrecked three times when he's giving his list of things that he went through. And then when Eurachlodon, the storm came that ultimately sank the ship and left them on uh, Malta, he didn't pray for the rain to stop or for the storms to stop. But you know what he had? And the scripture is very clear. He had a very strong relationship with the Lord. He had a very strong relationship with the Lord in that he told Paul, hey, encourage everyone on the ship that none of the souls will be lost. So he didn't go up on the bow of the ship and start praying that the rain would stop. The relationship that he had with God instructed him to encourage them that no souls would be lost if they didn't do certain things. And they heeded what he said, and none of the souls were lost. I think that prayer is more about relationship. It's like having a conversation. If I only talk with my wife once a week on Sundays and tell her, no, I love you, I really do, and I'll see you next week, that relationship is probably not going to be that strong, is it? And so when we come to church, we find ourselves, maybe at the end of service, 
where we're, we're offered a time of prayer. And for some people, that might actually be the only time that they pray. Well, what kind of relationship are they really living out in the world today for God? I just want to encourage us to take the scriptures, to pray. When do we pray? We pray when we're suffering. We pray when we're soaring. We pray when we're succumbing to sickness. We pray when we're struggling with sin. We pray with spiritual strength for supernatural results, praise God, because we serve a supernatural God, and nothing, nothing is impossible for him. Do you agree? Amen. That's the truth. And then lastly, verses 19 and 20, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which covereth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. We should be praying when and for those who are straying, straying from the faith, straying in their relationship, where it becomes something else. And this effectual fervent prayer is something that we are to continue with. I pray for a lot of folks that actually don't grace, don't even allow the shadow of their bodies to grace the doorways of our church that have been here before, and I continue to lift them up, especially those that I know have strayed from the faith, those that have strayed from the faith. And so in these few passages of Scripture, he talks about us, uh, talks about times to pray. The Lord Jesus Christ himself showed us how we are to pray. James is telling us when we should be praying, and it almost sounds like we should be praying without ceasing. Whether we're suffering, whether we're soaring, if we're at the bottom or if we're at the top, if we're feeling great, if we're feeling sick, if we're feeling weak, if we're in emotional turmoil, if we find ourselves in sin and praying for those who are in sin for their souls, that they would come to faith in Christ, praying this way with spiritual strength for supernatural results, for it is only God who can save a soul. It is only God who saves. The only way to the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm almost convinced that no one gets saved unless someone is praying for them. Now, I know that God is sovereign and we can talk about his providence and we could talk about how he knows the beginning from the end, the ends, the out. He knew us from the foundation, whether we're gonna get saved or not. I'm telling you right now, I got saved because a few folks were praying for me and they had almost given up on me. If you know somebody who needs the Lord, start by praying for them. Fervent. Don't give up on them. I'm thankful that God didn't give up on me, amen? And so I'm encouraged to pray for others, and especially those who have strayed, those who have taken this Bible and have created some kind of um, mystic, God who's trapped in heaven, who can't do anything without our permission, giving him permission to be able to do anything. Like he made a contract and that contract was broken and he lost earth. God failed, by the way, when you say that, failed and, and lost everything. And then it was regained. And then now we have it. And now, brothers and sisters, listen. What does scripture clearly tell us? God knew Adam was going to sin. God knew all the things that were going to take place. God knows the number of hairs that are on your head. The sovereignty and the providence of God goes far beyond anything that we could possibly wrap our minds around. And he tells us that this life is short. This life is a vapor. Have you secured your real life in heaven? Because that is where it really begins. I'm thankful to have relationships and friendships with people on this earth. I'm thankful that he has given me a mouth and eyes and ears and hands, and I'm fully functional to be able to go out and do some good for some folks for a very short period of time. But the most important thing and the thing that will last forever in all eternity 
The fruit that remains are going to be the souls that are saved in this little window that we've been given. And I think that we should commit ourselves praying for the lost in our families, in our communities, and ultimately in our nation as we see people rising to power to supposedly represent the people. Pray for their salvation as well. Fervently and earnestly. Amen? This is the conclusion of James chapter 5. <laughs> God is good to us. Amen? Have you found it difficult to pray? Well, don't wait until you're suffering. Start. Have you found it difficult with everything that's going on to pray for somebody who has actually harmed you? I pray that you would ask God to show you the forgiveness that's needed, the same forgiveness that he gave us. It's abundant that we would all be free, that we could be healed. Amen? Thank you, Lord. I want to take this time to pray for our brothers and sisters who are not here with us today. John and Phyllis are at home, and I know that Mama Marlene has been suffering with some headaches, and uh, Laurel has head congestion and has been kind of battling that through the course of this week. Anyone else come to mind? Christine is struggling with the same thing. Dale, Dale, yes, yes. Anyone else? We're just going to conclude our service in prayer, amen? Father, we thank you that we have your word. Our efforts tonight are to glean into what you've told James by the power of your spirit and that we would understand it in all truth and sincerity, trusting you for all results. Our desires are to live our lives in your will. Lord, we have many that are not with us tonight and they are uh, suffering with headaches or uh, head congestion, achiness in their bodies. Lord, we lift them up to you. We don't just say that we speak life, but we ask for their wholeness and their restoration that comes from your hand. You are a good father and you desire good for them. Lord, that you would touch their bodies, that they would become whole, that they would be energized, that the head cold would go away in the name of Jesus, that the headaches would go away in your powerful name, the name of Jesus, that the aching would go away in your name, the powerful name of Jesus. We speak life in this way. We thank you, Lord, that your healing hand is upon us and is upon them and that you would touch them and raise them up and strengthen them by the power of your might, by your good hand of mercy, by your powerful hand of healing, by the grace that you have afforded us, afforded us all, Lord, that you would raise them up with strength, with life, with vigor. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the report. We thank you, Lord, that we see these things happening all around us. We thank you, Lord, for the great healing that took place in Michael. Lord, thank you for these things. And thank you, Lord, that you're touching them now. Thank you, God. You are our redeemer. You are our banner, our champion, our life, our Lord, our savior. You are the king of glory, the creator of all things, and nothing is impossible for you. And so we lift up these people to you, Lord. Before your throne, we place them there in your good care, knowing that your perfect will 
is being done in their lives, over their lives. And we're not afraid to pray, your will be done. Your will be done. This should be our mantra. This should be how we live our lives. Not my will, but your will be done. Touch them and raise them up. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.